The space. Have you ever noticed that air conditioners only break down during the summer? It was a scorching summer in Chicago, so hot that you felt you could ignite a match by just holding it out the window. My tiny office air conditioner had conked out two days ago, with a final wheeze and groan, leaving me drenched in sweat. I would have rather been cooling off at Plato's place with a cold drink, but I was stuck waiting for a one o'clock appointment. There was no way I was going to miss meeting the woman with the sultry voice I'd heard on the phone. It was like something out of an old movie, reminiscent of Lauren Bacall's smoky tone. She hadn't given her name before hanging up. All she left me with was the mystery of her missing husband. The sound of her heels echoed in the hallway, and her silhouette paused outside my door, which bore the words Mike Green, Private Investigations on Frosted Glass. I hastily buttoned my shirt and straightened my tie as she entered. I've encountered many striking individuals in my time, but she was like a figure from Vogue or Vanity Fair. I'm over six feet tall, and she was just a bit shorter, with long blonde hair that perfectly framed her striking face, complete with high cheekbones and piercing blue eyes. Her elegant suit hinted at her refined figure, complemented by impressively long legs. As she approached, I stood and offered a handshake. Like Green, I introduced myself. Richardson, she said, seating herself and smoothly crossing her legs, Mrs. Arthur Richardson. Her smile told me she enjoyed my surprised reaction. Yes, Mr. Green, the very same Arthur Richardson who outsmarted you years back. Her words took me back to the case involving her husband's embezzlement which had tarnished my reputation after he was acquitted thanks to a crafty lawyer. She observed me with an amused expression. You fit the image of a private investigator perfectly. And what image is that? I inquired. Tall, imposing, with a look that says you've been through your fair share of troubles, she described, noting the signs of my past encounters. I laughed lightly, acknowledging her accurate read. So, Mrs. Richardson, what brings you here today? I'm presenting you a chance to even the odds, Mr. Green. Art caught wind of my plans to divorce him and vanished without a trace. He's indifferent to our relationship, but the financial impact of a divorce is something he wants to avoid. My interest peaked when she mentioned the financial repercussions for that jerk. How long has he been missing? Just over a month. Have you contacted the police? Yes, I filed a missing persons report, but they didn't show much concern. They suspect he's living comfortably with his new flame. They did help me install a tracking app on my phone, promising it would locate his phone the moment he used it, but I've got nothing. I understand you don't handle unfaithfulness cases, but missing persons are within your scope. Here's my offer, I'll pay you $20,000 plus expenses to locate my husband, and an extra $50,000 if you incidentally discover proof of his affairs. Do you think he's unfaithful? I'm certain of it. He's involved with at least two other women, probably hiding away with one of them right now. I'm not interested in the details, I just need him found so I can serve him the papers. I pulled out a contract from my desk, detailing her terms, $20,000 for locating her husband an additional $50,000 for evidence of his affairs, with a $5,000 advance to start. She signed immediately. I don't have the full advance on me, she mentioned, pulling out some cash, but I'll have the rest delivered to you by tomorrow, is that okay? Checks are acceptable, I pointed out. I prefer you begin immediately, without the delay of waiting for a check to clear, she insisted. I accepted the $3,000 in cash she had, issued her a receipt, and then spent an hour gathering more information. I inquired about any acquaintances he might visit, the amount of cash he took, potential hidden assets, out-of-state properties, and whether he left with his car. She provided his driver's license and all known financial details, suspecting there were more she was unaware of. She had no knowledge of his business ventures or associates. I knew of his expulsion from his company due to embezzlement, but lost track after his court case. As Mrs. Richardson exited my office, I couldn't help but notice her poised walk and the smooth outline of her skirt, hinting at her lack of undergarments. I pondered whether it was the weather or a deliberate allure on her part to secure my services. Either way, it was unnecessary. I was already intent on delivering those papers to him, eager to witness his reaction firsthand. Periodically, I had been dedicating myself to a personal investigation. Our state's lieutenant governor was notoriously corrupt. A few months back, an anonymous source alerted me to a dubious real estate deal he was orchestrating. A bit of initial digging convinced me the tip was solid. I detest corrupt officials, yet I had to tread cautiously. This was a high-stakes game. Revealing my suspicions prematurely could cost me my license, or worse, land me in jail. No way was I taking that risk. The case of the missing person provided a convenient diversion, allowing me to lay low in case the lieutenant governor's team was on my trail. Plus, I had a score to settle with Richardson. He had outsmarted me before, and it was time for some payback. I started scouring the computer with the details provided by the wife, but hit a dead end. I knew cracking this wouldn't be simple. The guy was clever, and I had previously misjudged him, a mistake I wouldn't repeat. I needed a starting point, any lead would do. I decided to begin where it all ended. It had been two years since I last visited the offices of Richardson and Walker Industrial Lighting, now just Walker's Industrial Lighting. The secretary recognized me immediately, her face giving away her recognition as I entered. 
I'm aware of who you are, Mr. Green, but your name isn't on Mr. Walker's schedule, and I doubt it will be anytime soon. Her cold reception was expected. Listen, just inform him I have a plan to settle scores with a common adversary. She regarded me silently for a moment before directing, sit over there. I'll check if he's willing to speak with you. As I waited, unsure of the duration or the meeting's outcome, I picked up a magazine. However, I had barely flipped through it when Walker's door swung open. He appeared, visibly annoyed. What do you want, Green? Did you recover our funds? No, I admitted, that money is likely lost for good. But together, we might just manage some retribution. He hesitated, then returned to his office, leaving the door ajar, a silent invitation. I followed, settling into a chair as he resumed his place behind the desk, his expression unchanging. I'm puzzled why I'm even listening to you. Last time, you promised a recovery of the embezzled funds. Not only did that not happen, but I also ended up paying your fee. So speak up, and it had better be compelling, otherwise, I may just have security eject you through that window. I could tell he was irked, but seriously, as far as I was aware, they didn't have any security measures in place. Still, I wasn't going to rile him up, I was hoping he might have some information that could help. I shared with him how Richardson's wife had hired me to track him down and explain the reason. I'm aiming to deliver those divorce papers to him personally, I mentioned. I could even say they're delivered with your best wishes. I didn't expect it, but this comment managed to coax a slight grin from him. What do you need from me? He inquired. Anything you might know about his behavior when he was employed here, acquaintances, favorite spots to unwind, any details that might aid in finding him, perhaps a secluded place where he took his companions. His wife suspects he's living with someone but has no clue who, I explained. He snorted. Folks like him change partners like they're going out of style, he remarked. I recall a couple of women he was close with a while back, but that's old news. Who knows how many he's been with since then? Any information you can provide, I pressed on. An ex might know about the current one. You've heard what they say about a woman scorned. He pressed the intercom button. Dory, could you step in here for a moment, please? Moments later, Walker's polished secretary appeared, offering him a smile while shooting me a look of disdain. Impressive, she was quite the professional. I mused if Walker was privy to her full range of skills. Dory, you interacted with the two women Richardson was seeing more than I did. Do you remember their names? I have their names, addresses, and phone numbers, Mr. Walker. Our surprise was evident. He would have me send them gifts. Their details are saved in our system. He would even have me dial their number before taking the call himself. This was a jackpot moment for me. Eagerly, I probed further. Is there a secret spot, maybe a romantic retreat, where he'd take his companion, somewhere his wife wouldn't find them? I'm afraid I don't have such information, she replied coolly. Dory, please print out everything you have on these two women and anything else that might help in locating Richardson. He's vanished and we're going to assist Green in finding him. Her look towards her boss conveyed reluctance, but she agreed and returned to her desk. Walker then focused on me again. All right, Ace, Dory will get you those printouts. Leave your card for her in case she finds more. Just so we're clear, I'm helping out because I want to see Richardson in trouble, not because I think highly of you. I stood up, not bothering with formalities, and joined Dory by her desk where she already had the documents ready. Here's all the information, she offered, handing me a sheet. Digging into my jacket pocket, I retrieved the business card she initially declined. Your boss suggested I leave this with you, just in case more details come to light, I mentioned, placing it on her desk. Feeling somewhat optimistic, I had at least one, possibly two leads to follow. The sweltering heat outside was a stark contrast to the cool interior I just exited. Thoughts of visiting Plato's crossed my mind when a sudden unease washed over me, the feeling of unseen eyes lurking. Two decades in the private investigation business have honed my instincts to trust such sensation. I casually surveyed the surroundings as I lit a cigarette, noting nothing overtly suspicious, typical for downtown Chicago, yet the nagging feeling persisted. Leading anyone directly to my leads was the last thing I wanted. I opted to head back to my office instead. Upon entry, I shed my coat and shoulder holster, securing my Beretta in my desk's top drawer. Then I fetched a bottle of Dewar's White Label and a glass from my filing cabinet, needing a moment to sort my thoughts. With only two active cases, Richardson's and the lieutenant governor's, a sudden realization struck me. Richardson, clever as he was, had his wife tailed, always staying a step ahead. Could my office have been compromised during my absence? Paranoia seemed a prudent ally at this juncture. I re-equipped myself, leaving my unfinished doors, and headed to a nearby diner. After eating, I slipped out the back, circling to my car, and drove to a discreet electronics shop. Angelo, or Angie, was my go-to for such matters. He greeted me as I entered. Hey, Mike, what's up? Ever feel like you're being watched, Angie? I asked. He chuckled, dismissing the idea as foreign to his line of work. Concerned about being tailed and possibly bugged, I handed him my phone. Could you check this out? After a thorough inspection, Angie reassured me, your phone's clean, Mike. Encouraging news, I thought to myself. All right, thanks. Could you possibly visit my office to perform the scan? Sure, he replied, glancing at the clock. 
I'll head out in an hour. Fantastic. Angie, thanks. See you then. Scanning my office wasn't new for him. It had become a familiar routine. He'd casually mention he was nearby and drop by to greet me. We'd chat normally while he discreetly checked the room for any surveillance devices, ensuring that if he found anything, we wouldn't alert the person who planted it. As expected, he located the device quickly, hidden expertly in the frame of my Venetian blinds. Clearly, the person Mr. Richardson employed was skilled. We left the device untouched. Let's head downstairs, Angie, I announced, playing it cool for any listeners. Once out of the device's earshot, I contacted my client. She answered after a few rings. That was quick. I was just at your office a while ago. Got a mix of news for you, Mrs. Richardson, I responded, hearing her apprehensive breath. Hit me with the good news first. I've got a couple of solid leads, I revealed. That's relieving. What's the not-so-good news? Seems like you're being shadowed. What? How do you figure? In this line of work, you get an intuition. I felt watched earlier today. So, I checked my office and found a bug. Are you certain it's art? Could be related to another case. No. Think about it, Mrs. Richardson. It's the perfect way to stay ahead of you. That deceitful man, she muttered. He's clever, that's certain. But we might turn this situation to our advantage. How so? I outlined my strategy, but as the day was ending, we agreed to reconvene the next morning. At 10 a.m., she burst into my office, fuming. Why didn't you disclose you were the detective from that past fiasco? She accused. I silently handed her a secure phone with instructions to use it for future communications. She nodded, understanding, placed the rest of my fee on the table, and said, had I known your identity, I wouldn't have employed you. And I'm rectifying that mistake now. You're fired. Wait a minute, I pleaded, but she turned and walked out, the door closing sharply behind her, almost shattering the glass. Well, that's something, I muttered to myself, reclining in my chair with an amused grin. I had little regard for Derek Knutson, he was a sleuth for hire. I call him that because he really tarnished the reputation of private investigators. Mrs. Richardson was en route to his office, where she would present herself under an alias and spin a yarn of deception. After leading him on a merry chase, she'd leave with a simple bat of her eyelashes, leaving him puzzled over the whole encounter. Naturally, anyone tracking her would think she'd switched from hiring me to employing him. This would shift their focus onto Nutson, giving me some breathing room. I needed to ensure that my scheme was effective, so I busied myself with errands before heading to Plato's place for some refreshments. Stan, the bartender I preferred, noticed me as soon as I entered and promptly had a chilled beer ready for me. Our history ran deep, even to the extent of him once dating my ex-wife. We chatted briefly before he had to attend to his duties, leaving me to mull over my latest investigation. The common mantra in my line of work is follow the money, but having tried and failed with that approach two years prior, I knew better. Richardson had a talent for concealing his financial trails. However, everyone has a weak spot, something that leaves them exposed. My observations led me to believe that Richardson's weakness was his fondness for companionship. Abandoning the financial angle, I decided to trace a path through the emotional upheavals he left behind. As I had remarked to Walker, there's truth in the saying about the wrath of a spurned individual. My thoughts then drifted to Stacy. Within 40 minutes, I found myself at her doorstep, ringing the bell. She answered, a stunning figure with her natural red hair and bright green eyes making her stand out distinctly. Dressed elegantly in a black outfit complemented with heels, she was a vision of grace. Wow, I blurted out, if you weren't my ex-wife, I might have proposed again right there. She laughed lightly, always with the excuses. I apologize, Stace, I should have called first. I didn't realize you had plans. She nodded, opening the door further. It's all right, just need to grab my bag. I entered, scanning for any signs of a visitor but found none. I should probably leave, Stace, don't want to interrupt. You're not going anywhere without me, she stated, her gaze holding mine, handbag in hand. So, where are we off to? Confused, I responded, but, you're all dressed up. Don't you have a date? She smiled warmly, I dressed up for you, silly. Now, come on, I'm starving. I took her by the arm as we walked to my car, pondering how she had known I was coming. Being a detective, unraveling mysteries was my forte, and this one was particularly nagging at me. Once we were seated in the car, I couldn't hold back. Stacy, how did you know I was coming? Telepathy, she replied with a smirk. Telepathy? Yes, I had a hunch you'd show up tonight, so I sent out a vibe. It's like sending a message out into the universe. It finds the right people, you know. I was sure she was just spinning a yarn, not really wanting to give away her secret. I played along with a skeptical yeah. Right, which made her laugh, a sound I found pleasantly infectious. As we ordered our meal, the answer hit me. Oh, of course, Stan must have tipped you off after I mentioned my plans at Plato's. She just smiled widely, confirming my suspicion without a word. Our outings often led to playful and intense moments, fueled by a strong mutual attraction. After dinner, the anticipation built as we reached her place, both of us eager to be close. I'm not sure how, but moments later, we were entangled on the bed, lost in a passionate embrace. The connection was electric, our movements synchronized in a dance of desire. Her soft sighs filled the room as we moved together, each moment intensifying the next. 
Wow, I gasped, catching my breath, feeling her leave and return shortly after with a warm cloth, tenderly caring for me. Are you staying over? She asked. With a smile, I answered, if you're inviting me, then yes. Good. Just give me a moment to catch my breath, and then we can be close again, she said, her lips tracing my neck, sending shivers down my spine. You know, with you, I hardly need an invitation, I replied, feeling the warmth of our connection. We continued to explore our affection for each other, each touch and kiss deepening our bond, lost in the comfort and closeness of each other's presence. I remained silent, simply moving closer to her. She was a vision of beauty, her form responding to the gentle closeness between us. Oh, 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 goodness, Mike, yes, gently, with affection, please. By around two in the morning, we were both wrapped up in each other's embrace, drifting into sleep. Just as I was about to succumb to slumber, I heard her whisper, I love you, Mike. The next day, as expected, the eavesdropping device in my office was removed, probably concealed in Knutson's office now. I wished I could revel in my ingenuity, but knowing Richardson's intelligence, I was aware that my trick wouldn't keep him fooled indefinitely, so it was time to act fast. I had two leads, Janet Stenson and Kathy Heyer. After thoroughly investigating both, I noted that Stenson had upgraded her living situation. I scrutinized their online profiles to recognize them instantly in person, gathering any useful information. It appeared that Heyer had moved on, socializing with a few men, while Stenson didn't seem connected to any men, hinting at her possibly still being involved with Richardson. I decided to investigate further and packed a digital voice recorder for any potential use. Assuming my involvement with Richardson was known, I made no pretense when I visited Stenson's residence. She hesitated before recognizing me. What do you want? Miss Stenson, I began, nodding and greeting, may I come in? Her response would reveal much. A denial could mean she was disconnected from Richardson, but if she was still involved and aware of his wife's suspicion, her reaction would be different. A less cautious person might shut me out immediately, but a more astute one would let me in, hoping to glean information to pass to Richardson. Yeah, sure, come on in, she said, stepping aside. Her financial backing was evident in the luxuriousness of her apartment, devoid of any employment evidence. Nice place, I remarked. Thanks, she replied tersely. So, what brings you here? I looked towards the leather couch, suggesting, may I sit down? She exhaled with a hint of annoyance. I suppose, she finally agreed. I made my way over and took a seat. My eyes caught her phone resting on the coffee table. How much I wished to sneak a peek, yet no plan formed to divert her attention long enough. Miss Stenson, may I address you as Janet? Yes, that's okay. Suddenly, her demeanor lightened. Clearly, she intended to probe for information, yet her skills paled in comparison to mine. Janet, Arthur Richardson has vanished. His wife is immensely distressed and has employed me to locate him. Do you want a beer? She interjected. This caught me off guard. Perhaps she sought a moment to strategize, or believed a beer might make me more talkative, thereby revealing more. Either way, it presented an opportunity. That would be splendid, thank you. Once she vanished into the kitchen, I quickly retrieved the voice-activated recorder from my pocket, switched it on, and concealed it beneath the couch. It would only record when detecting speech. I anticipated she might contact Richardson right after my departure. Additionally, I had another plan in mind. She returned promptly with the beer, placing it on a leather coaster on the glass table before me. I'm not sure how I can assist, Mr. Green. Art was an acquaintance, but we've lost touch over the years. His wife must be in distress. Have you uncovered any clues? Not as of yet, I was hoping you might shed some light. Let's not mince words, Janet, your connection with him was more than mere friendship. Given his wealth, I doubt Richardson would risk public venues. He probably has a secluded spot for private encounters, away from prying eyes. So, you think he's not abducted, just avoiding his wife deliberately, and keeping all possibilities open. However, discovering his secret retreat would be telling. If he's absent, it might suggest something sinister. What will you do if you locate him? His wife isn't oblivious, Janet. If he's found with someone else, so be it. She just needs to know he's safe. Right, she muttered, signaling her skepticism. Why did she choose you, Mr. Green? There must be dozens of detectives in Chicago. Janet, despite your partner's lawyer clearing him, I managed to uncover the truth. I excel in my work. Mrs. Richardson knows this. I understand, she said. Unfortunately, I can't assist you. As I mentioned, I haven't seen Art for a long time, and we never visited any secret places together. I was taken aback that Art's companion wasn't more skilled at deception, but I took that as my signal to act. I took a sip of my beer, stood up, and placed my business card on the table. Should you remember anything? I'll be sure to call you, she interjected, completing my thought. She escorted me to the door, bid farewell, and closed the door behind me. I was certain her next step would be to inform Richardson. The basic phone I spotted didn't seem to match her upscale apartment. Upon my arrival, I had parked a bit away and noticed the apartment's underground parking with a sizable entry gate. Observing a resident using a remote to access, I speculated that the upscale building likely allocated specific parking spots to its residents. My plan involved accessing this area, so I retrieved a special device from my car's trunk, 
humorously thinking of it as a superhero's tool, though it was merely a small electronic device. This gadget, bought from Angie's electronics store, could capture and replicate the radio frequency of garage door openers, allowing me entry. I waited outside Janet's place until a resident arrived. Soon after, a luxury car showed up, and my device successfully cloned the garage opener's signal. Inside, finding Janet's parking spot was easy. I muttered to myself, impressed by her high-end car, and proceeded to place a tracking device on it, ensuring it was well hidden and secure. My plan was to monitor her movements discreetly. After setting up the tracker, I prepared to keep a low profile, driving around to avoid suspicion before settling down to wait. Time passed, and just when I thought I might spend the night in my car, my tracker signaled movement. I followed her car to a nearby grocery store, where she started shopping. Using my binoculars, I observed her from a distance, taking the chance to retrieve my device. I quickly returned to the apartment complex, used my special access device to get through the garage, and rode the elevator up to the second floor. Picking locks on apartment doors is surprisingly easy, especially compared to private homes. With a lock pick and tension wrench from my pocket, I was inside the apartment in no time. I grabbed my recording device and headed back to my car swiftly. There were several recordings, most of which were brief, likely her talking to herself. The first substantial recording, though, was about eight minutes long. I listened eagerly, hoping to uncover something significant. Hi, it's me. Yes, it matters. You won't believe who came by asking questions. Mike Green. Right. He mentioned your wife sent him because she's concerned about you. Yes, I understand. I'm not sure. He seemed professional, but you never know. When? Got it. Or do I need to pick up? I'm not sure. Is cooking even possible on a boat? All right, I'll handle it tonight. I prefer not to rush out, just in case he's lurking around. Absolutely, I'll be cautious to ensure he doesn't tail me. I plan to leave around 3 in the morning, less traffic will make it easier to spot anyone following me. And what about my apartment, my car, everything I own? Okay, I'll meet you first thing on Friday. I love you, honey. It wasn't rocket science to deduce they were planning to flee. Checking my watch, it was nearly 11 p.m. Wednesday, I had until Friday morning to prepare, but there was nothing more to do that night, so I headed home to rest. The next day, I called Mrs. Richardson. Hello, Mrs. Richardson, this is Mike Green. Could you bring the divorce papers to my office today? Otherwise, I can come to collect them. You found him. Already, her voice was tinged with disbelief. I prefer not to confirm anything to clients until all details are confirmed. Not exactly, I replied, but I'm on a promising lead. If all goes well, I'll meet with your husband tomorrow. He should only get those papers from me, she insisted firmly. That's not the best idea, I cautioned. Firstly, I'm leaving around 2.30 a.m. Secondly, I'm not sure how your husband might react. He might be armed, for all I know, and I don't want to worry about both of our safety. I'm not concerned. That's precisely why I brought you on board. Just ensure you're prepared for anything. I doubt he'll resort to aggression. Sure, he'll be upset, but I don't think he'll actually act out. Regardless, I'll be there. I'll personally deliver those documents and meet his gaze confidently. Her voice conveyed determination, signaling she was set on her course. All right, I conceded with a resigned exhale, but you need to be at my office by 2.30 tonight, and don't be late. I'll be on time, Mr. Green. Count on it. After ending the call, I had a few more to make, yet the day seemed unusually slow. I rang up Stacy to check if she was free for lunch. We agreed to meet at DeMars, a cozy spot not far from her workplace. She seemed unusually subdued when I arrived. Hey, beautiful, how are you doing? Meh, she responded, giving a noncommittal shrug. Something bothering you today. I'll discuss it after we order, she said. Since we were regulars here, ordering was swift. The waitress noted our choices and left, returning shortly with our coffee, informing us our meal would be ready soon. So, what's on your mind? I asked, sensing her concern. Cradling her coffee, she paused before speaking. The other night, you joked about if we weren't already ex-partners, you'd propose again. Oh, did you ever seriously consider it, proposing again, I mean? Her question caught me off guard. We had a whirlwind start, meeting through a friend and quickly becoming inseparable, leading to a spontaneous wedding. But the strains of my job as a private investigator and the demands of married life soon showed we weren't compatible. Stacy, we've been down that road, remember. My job hasn't changed. I'm still the guy with erratic hours. Like tonight, I have to leave at 2.30 for a case, and I can't predict when I'll return. I, well, it's just that we've both grown, Mike, matured. When we first got married, I wasn't fully aware. I knew your job, but not the depth of it, now I understand. Mike, after our separation, I met several others, yet none could replace you. You've never left my thoughts. I was speechless, unsure of how to respond. Holding her cup with both hands, she took a sip. So, what do you think? You're supposed to say you still love me, she said, hesitantly. The truth is, Stacy, I do love you. But loving you makes me cautious. Do you think you won't worry about my safety on the job? That you won't feel anxious about my whereabouts and well-being? She looked at me. I have a colleague whose husband is a firefighter. 
They've managed for 20 years. She shared her coping strategies with me. If she can manage, so can I, Mike. Then our meal arrived. The idea of remarrying Stacy wasn't repulsive, but I had my reservations. I need time to think, Stace. Just give me some time. She gave a resigned smile, as though anticipating my reluctance. No pressure, Mike, I just wanted to raise the point. Our lunch continued under a somber mood. As we parted, I gave her a quick kiss and promised to consider her words, which seemed to cheer her up slightly. Back at my office, I reviewed my to-do list again. There was one more call I planned to make late that night. Deciding to head home for some rest, Stacy's words haunted me, replaying over and over. By eight, I abandoned the idea of sleep, feeling peckish. I made coffee and heated a frozen meal, then settled down to watch a marathon of Mike Hammer on TV. By one in the morning, with no more episodes left, I drove to my office for that last call. Everything set. Great, see you at the gathering. Thanks. After ensuring everything was in order, I relaxed and awaited my client's early arrival, carrying a large envelope. I briefed her on our plan and confirmed I was prepared, as always. At 2.30 a.m., we were parked outside an apartment complex. I set up a makeshift stand for my laptop in the car and prepared for the night ahead. What's going on here? We're using this method to find her. I've set up a system that syncs with the tracking device I placed in her vehicle. We'll allow her to gain some distance before we follow. She won't have a clue that we're tailing her. Wow, that's clever. It's like being in a spy movie, Mrs. Richardson remarked, lightly laughing. Not exactly, I countered. The gadgets in those movies have their limits. My setup uses satellites. She could drive across the country and we'd still be able to track her. Right on cue, I noted as the garage door began to rise. We observed as the silver car exited. Glancing at my laptop, I confirmed her location moving north on Michigan Avenue. In the spirit of a classic detective, Mrs. Richardson, the chase is on. I monitored her turn onto Division, then we followed suit. She merged onto the northbound interstate, and I sensed a long journey ahead. Around five, we reached Rockford, where she seemed to stop, likely for a rest. We also paused, grabbing some coffee, and then noticed she was on the move again as I returned to the car. Next, we were navigating a rural highway, careful to maintain a discreet distance. After 20 minutes and minimal traffic, we neared the state border. Just before crossing, she veered left onto a secluded road, drove a bit, then halted. We've arrived, I announced. Arrived where? It's just forest here. Just beyond is a small lake. She's at a property on Pier Drive, right by the water. Let's get going then. The quicker we finish this, the better. Continuing a short distance, we spotted her car. I parked quietly to avoid detection and we approached the house. I listened at the door, hearing a male voice. Testing the door and finding it unlocked, I signaled to my partner, and we entered abruptly. Janet let out a shout, and Richardson appeared stunned. He glared at his girlfriend, accusing, you brought them right to us. She was speechless, her mouth moving but silent. The tension seemed disproportionate to the circumstance. Take this, shouted Richardson's estranged partner, tossing an envelope onto the table before him. I was keeping an eye on Richardson, not focusing much on his wife. When he revealed the contents of the envelope, I realized the supposed divorce documents were merely blank sheets. At that moment, Mrs. Richardson delved into her purse and produced a shiny .38 caliber revolver, swiftly aiming it at me. Carefully now, Mike, remove your firearm using only two fingers, she directed. I questioned whether a sophisticated woman like her could operate such a firearm. As I cautiously reached for my gun, contemplating a quick move against her, we were interrupted by Eric Wilson, the Illinois lieutenant governor, known for his many scandals. He approached with a smug expression, taking the revolver from Mrs. Richardson's hand. Left with no option, I slowly withdrew my Beretta, holding it gingerly between two fingers. Place it down gently, then step back, Wilson commanded. I complied, shocked. He taunted, those tracking devices come in handy. I've had one on your vehicle all along. You discovered the bug in your office but never suspected your car. His words caught me off guard. You thought Richardson was behind the office bug. Carla and I had a good laugh about that. I turned to my ex-boss. So, you never visited Nutson's office. She scoffed, why would I? Wilson chided, missing that was quite unprofessional, Mike. I responded lightly, well, I can't catch everything. He chuckled. That'd be an amusing note for your epitaph. He didn't catch everything. Mrs. Richardson grew impatient. Eric, let's finish this and leave. I pleaded, wait, this doesn't add up. Why am I the target? Just end it, darling, she urged impatiently. Wilson grinned broadly. No, she's right. He deserves to know the game he's been caught in. But first, secure his gun. Mrs. Richardson collected my firearm and stood beside Wilson. Did you think you could snoop on me undetected? Any decent investigator would know someone in my position is always watching. I planned to make your demise look like an unfortunate robbery gone wrong, but then Carla discovered the offshore account details of her husband. Taken aback, Richardson looked at his wife, you found the account numbers. The malicious grin on her face stripped away the pretense, revealing her true, heartless nature. Exactly, dear. Then why this charade? Why not just divorce me? 
You have more than enough reasons. She sneered. Oh, Art, don't be naive. Why settle for half when I can have everything? I glanced at Wilson. So, you and Carla are involved. He chuckled heartily. Green, you missed your calling as a detective. Art chimed in again. I knew you were up to something, I just didn't know with whom. What made you marry me in the first place? Our marriage was never real. For the wealth, obviously, dear. You were wealthier than anyone else I was seeing at the time. Wilson picked up the thread. Once she discovered the financial details, we plotted to eliminate you, Art. Unfortunately, you overheard Carla mentioning your planned accident over the phone and escaped. That's when I thought of the perfect plan, to solve both our problems at once. It's common knowledge that you and Art don't get along. You embarrassed him publicly. So, when the police arrive, they'll think you shot each other. This firearm, he indicated the one he was holding, is Art's. He forgot it when he fled. So, I'll use his gun on you, then yours on him, tying up all loose ends. Imagine the headlines. He mused, long-standing feud ends in tragedy, too dead. It's poetic. What about Janet? I inquired. Regrettably, he glanced at her. She's just in the wrong place at the wrong time. His plan won't work, I declared. Of course, it will. Minutes after you left your office tonight, my associate entered. He took the financial evidence you handed Carla and made sure there's nothing linking us to you. He also fabricated threatening messages from your computer to Art's email. Once we return, he'll alter Art's laptop records to match. Carla will testify that you confronted Art personally. After that, Art supposedly vanished. It seems you found him to settle a grudge. It's a flawless plan, Mike. Facing the threat was daunting, but I needed the full story. I subtly turned towards the hidden microphone under my collar. Did you catch all that, Lieutenant? Every word, a voice echoed from the doorway. Lieutenant Dan Reardon of the Chicago PD, flanked by the Illinois State Police with their guns drawn, made an imposing entrance. Eric's mouth hung open in disbelief while Carla let out a shriek. Hand them over, Reardon ordered. Reluctantly, Carla and Eric surrendered their firearms. Eric's gaze met mine, his face a mask of astonishment. How? It was supposed to be perfect. How did you know? I couldn't help but smile. Well, had you mentioned those secret accounts, I might have been none the wiser, I said, eyeing Carla. I spent ages chasing the funds your husband had siphoned off, only to come up empty-handed. It was clear to me that someone capable of concealing such wealth could easily deceive a court during a divorce, leaving you with nothing. And your insistence on paying me in cash instead of a check was peculiar. Not many are comfortable carrying large sums around. Then, the inconsistencies began to surface. You claimed to have reported a missing person to the police, but my inquiries revealed no such report had ever been made. Connecting the dots, the picture began to form. I couldn't pinpoint it, but I sensed foul play. When you insisted on delivering those documents personally to your husband, I knew the climax would unfold here. I briefed Lieutenant Reardon on my suspicions. And Eric, you weren't the only one on our trail. As I concluded my explanation, Reardon had already handcuffed the culprits. Are you all right? He asked. Yes, I'm fine, I responded, accepting my gun back from him while he bagged the other for evidence. I'll give a detailed statement tomorrow. Watching from the doorway, we saw the police separate Wilson and Carla, escorting them to different vehicles. I need a drink, declared Richardson. Joining you, a scotch for me, I agreed. He glanced at Janet, who was seated quietly at the table, her hands trembling, eyes brimming with tears. Richardson hurried to her, kneeling and embracing her. It's all right, everything's okay now. She enveloped him in a tight embrace, burying her face in his chest. I, I thought it was the end for us, she wept. I truly believed we were all going to meet our end. While Richardson attempted to console her, I made my way to his liquor stash and prepared three scotches. Here, I offered, placing two glasses on the table. It required a few strong drinks and nearly an hour of gentle reassurances from her partner before Janet could form coherent sentences again. Once she began to articulate her thoughts, they resonated with me. As I was about to depart, she looked up at me, gratitude in her eyes. Mr. Green, we are in your debt. How can we ever repay you? Richardson bristled at this. Janet, he's the one who brought them to us. Art, it was inevitable they would find us, she argued. Once Carla discovered those accounts, your days were numbered. She couldn't access the funds if you were alive, but as your widow, she'd have full rights. Suddenly, her expression lightened. I've got it. We can repay Mike by returning the funds you diverted from your company. What? Richardson exclaimed, taken aback. Art, didn't you claim your net worth was around $9 million? Yes, but, and how much of that was embezzled? Before he could answer, I chimed in, four million. Her astonishment was palpable. Four million dollars. She echoed, turning to Richardson. Art, I refuse to live on ill-gotten gains. Subtract four from nine, and we still have five million. That's plenty for us. Darling, there was a reason for the embezzlement. I don't care, she cut him off. It was wrong and illegal. We need to return it. And how does giving the money back benefit him? Richardson countered. It would repair his reputation, she insisted. I couldn't help but add, and let's not forget my 10% finder's fee. She gave Richardson a pointed look. See, Art, if you really love me, you'll make it right. 
Despite Richardson's knack for persuasion and financial secrecy, I was certain he wouldn't relinquish the money. Leaving them to their debate, I headed out, weary and famished, with a long drive ahead. My journey began with a stop at a charming local diner for breakfast. Throughout the drive, my mind lingered on Stacy's suggestion that we give our relationship another try. Living as a bachelor was a mixed blessing. On one side, I enjoyed the liberty to move freely and handle my affairs without explaining myself or updating someone on my whereabouts, especially during long absences. However, the downside was the solitude of returning to an empty apartment, with nothing but microwave dinners for company. Reflecting on our marriage, I recall it wasn't just arguments, we shared genuinely joyful moments. Internally, I was torn, a sentiment I'd never openly confess. Despite my tough exterior, Stacy's departure had brought me to tears. Perhaps there was room for middle ground. By the time I returned to my office in the afternoon, fatigue and frustration had set in. Missing out on a significant financial opportunity stung, yet the potential media coverage might boost my professional reputation. I organized my case files, including the Richardson, Wilson case, and updated my records. After discovering evidence supporting Wilson's claims in my emails and noticing missing documents, I contacted the police to report my findings, agreeing to await a specialist's examination of my computer. Evening approached as the forensic examination concluded. I grabbed a quick meal at a local diner before heading home to rest. The following morning, I was jolted awake by my ringing phone. Lois Dowling from the Chicago Tribune was outside my office, eager for an interview about the Eric Wilson case. As I rushed through my morning routine, I realized the urgency of the day, needing to provide a statement at the police station. Lieutenant Reardon's inquiry upon my arrival hinted at the unfolding complexities of the case, setting the stage for a day filled with professional challenges and media attention. I passed him a thick, legal-sized envelope. Wilson didn't just randomly choose me, Dan. I've been quietly investigating him for the past six months. I haven't got concrete evidence yet, but he's involved in illegal financial activities worth millions for someone. He's also been involved in some serious misappropriation of funds, enough to consider charges of major theft, larceny, and perhaps even racketeering. I've nearly pieced it together, but I've spent enough time and resources on this, so it's yours now, I explained. Great, he responded with a hint of sarcasm, as if our workload wasn't heavy enough. We entered an interview room set up with video and audio recording equipment. After giving a two-hour statement, Reardon and I grabbed lunch. Our friendship dated back to his early days on the force and my time in security. By the time I returned to my office, it was past three, and I pondered calling Alois for some potential free press. My other option was to visit Plato's. While deciding, my office door opened. I expected a journalist, but the person who entered caught me off guard. Debating whether to grab my gun, I asked, Richardson, why are you here? He sank into a chair, placing a regular-sized envelope on my desk. What's this? Inside are two cashier's checks, he revealed. The first, for 3,600,000, payable to my old firm, and the second is your 10% commission. He continued, Janet was concerned Walker might cheat you, so she insisted on two checks. I was skeptical. What's the catch? No catch. I genuinely appreciate her, he stated. I replied skeptically, hard to believe you value anyone that highly. He countered, you don't know me as well as you think. I built that company from scratch. When I met Carla, everything seemed perfect. She seemed truly into me. He went on, but a year into the marriage, I was shocked by the money she spent. I avoided confronting it, fearing I'd lose her. Instead, I considered expanding the business. At a social event, I met Walker, who offered the capital needed for my business's growth. He was to be a silent investor, yet soon he was overtly involved, shifting our business dealings and influencing decisions. Our partnership soured as he began to overtake my company's operations, keeping me only for my reputation, a situation I knew wouldn't last. Walker was a cunning man, and I sensed early on that he would betray me. That's when I decided to safeguard my interest, secretly siphoning off $4 million over a year. My biggest error was underestimating your detective skills, even though you never did locate the funds. How Carla stumbled upon those figures remains a mystery to me, it must have been a bizarre stroke of luck. What about Janet? How did she become involved in all this? Janet was my lifeline. We met around four years ago, at a time when my marriage was falling apart. Carla was notoriously unfaithful, gallivanting around with numerous men. I would have left her, but my business woes consumed me, and I couldn't face the ordeal of a divorce amidst all that chaos. Janet brought serenity and understanding into my life. She was not only beautiful but also compassionate and attentive. With her, I found love again. And what about Kathy Heyer? Kathy's just a friend, nothing more. Walker's secretary suggested you had an affair with her as well. Dory tends to think the worst of people. Maybe she jumped to conclusions because I sent Kathy flowers a few times and arranged dinner for us. In reality, Kathy was dealing with the end of a long-term relationship and was feeling pretty low. I was merely trying to lift her spirits, showing her that she wasn't to blame. Anyway, he said, rising suddenly, that's the entirety of my story. 
The authorities want me to stay in town until the trial, but once it's done, Janet and I plan to relax under the tropical sun for the rest of our days. Take care, Green, he concluded, exiting the room. My experience has taught me that life is never just black or white. Every story has multiple perspectives. I glanced again at the check in my name for $400,000, still in disbelief. I dropped it off with my accountant on my way home, instructing him to deposit $20,000 into my account and to keep as much of the rest as possible away from the taxman. Legally, of course. The next morning, I entered Walker's office, greeted with the same lack of enthusiasm by Dory as before. You're like a bad penny, Green. I'm pretty sure he's eager to meet with me, sweetheart. I've got something he needs to see. The platinum-haired knockout pressed the intercom and announced my arrival to Walker, indicating I had something for him. He's ready for you, she informed me, gesturing towards his office door. I stayed on my feet, feeling uneasy about what I had to do. If Walker was as shady as Richardson claimed, he didn't deserve the package I was carrying. In my line of work, you sometimes have to do things you'd rather not, and this was one of those moments. I retrieved the envelope from my jacket and placed it on his desk. He noticed the company name on it. What's this? He inquired. Take a look, I said coolly. His face mirrored the surprise I felt. Three million, six, he exclaimed, eyes wide. You retrieved it. But what about the rest? Remember, I take a 10% finder's fee, I reminded him. Oh, no, I don't recall that, he protested. Just as Richardson said, Walker was tricky. I figured you'd say that, I remarked, presenting him with the contract he signed upon hiring me. All right, fine, he conceded, aware I had the upper hand. I guess I should thank you. Save it, I retorted. Just last week, I faced some serious danger, but handing over this money to you tops the list of unpleasant tasks. Back at my office, I glanced through the newspaper's coverage of the incident at the lake house. It was time to share my perspective. I set up a modest press briefing in my office for later that day. The reporter, Alois, was charming and seemed quite taken with me. Stacy and I had always maintained an open relationship, allowing each other freedom. Previously, I might have pursued an encounter with someone like Alois, but it no longer felt appropriate. Checking my bank account, I grinned at the sight of the 20000 deposit. On a whim, I booked a table at a fancy local restaurant and checked if Stacy was available for dinner. She worried about her attire, but I reassured her, knowing she hadn't changed sizes since our marriage. Before heading out, I had a few errands to run. Arriving at Stacy's at 6.30 gave her ample time to get ready. She was thrilled with the dress I brought. Mike, this is stunning, but how can you afford this? It must have cost a fortune. Did you win the lottery or something? No, I just managed to settle an old account. Now come on, wear it. We don't have much time. Throughout dinner, Stacy was curious about the account I mentioned. I just teased her, saying she'd find out in the morning's newspaper. I figured the media would be all over it, which would save me from having to brag I could keep a bit of modesty, I reasoned, smirking to myself. As we finished our desserts and were lingering over our coffee, I felt it was the right moment. Oh, I almost forgot, I said, as I reached into my jacket pocket. Her reaction was priceless when I placed the elegant ring box from Tiffany's before her. She gasped so loudly that the whole restaurant turned to look. Tears welled up in her eyes as she excitedly placed the exquisite pear-shaped diamond on her finger, showing it off proudly. We're getting married, she exclaimed. Around us, the air filled with cheers of congratulations, echoed by the enthusiastic clapping from other guests. And the staff. My comment, unfaithful to her husband, Carla should be ashamed of what she did. Do you guys agree? Sub and comment below if you like this odd one. And I will be back with more videos soon, so I will see you there.